Hey, book lovers. My name is M, and I want to talk about books and cats. Books, books, cats, cats, cats. Hey, book lovers. Welcome back. Sorry about vanishing for a couple of weeks. I desperately needed a mental health break, and it also gave me some time to get started on some projects that I have been thinking about for a while, but I hadn't had time to really get organized yet. And it was such a good choice to take a little time. I am not good at prioritizing my own needs. They tend to be at the absolute bottom of my list, and uh, I knew that I needed some time off. And I actually took it. (laughs) Progress. I definitely waited until I absolutely couldn't take any more. And I also really struggled to make the choice to take a break. But I actually made the decision. And once I did, I felt like an enormous weight was just lifted off my shoulders. Incredible. (laughs) Absolutely no question that that was the correct choice. (laughs) So one of the most enjoyable projects that I started uh, during my break was my Reading Places series. This summer, I want to do more reading outside, and I live in an absolutely gorgeous place. I'm going to try to visit a bunch of places around Vermont, and who knows, maybe some other ones too, and I'm going to be taking pictures of places that I read. (laughs) If you follow the podcast on Instagram, then you have already seen my first couple reading places. I started out with a couple that were kind of close to home. The weather has just been absolutely gorgeous. The pictures are beautiful. The reading was spectacular. (laughs) I absolutely love reading outside. And yeah, I live in a beautiful place. It's a (laughs) no-brainer. Another thing that I started working on during the break was the Books and Cats Patreon. Now, I am sorry that I have to charge something for this, but it's only $3 a month. And it is going to include a bunch of bonus content. At the absolute minimum, you're going to be getting access to a new one of my short stories every month, and on top of that, I have all kinds of ideas for other stuff, and most of it's going on the Patreon. (laughs) If you want an example of one of my short stories, there is one that is a public post on the Patreon, so you can check it out. It is from my newest collection, 3.33 a.m., And then if you end up joining the Patreon, you can get the rest of the stories from that book immediately. (laughs) Unfortunately, to make some of my ideas happen, I need to have some kind of income, and every little bit is so greatly appreciated. I promise I'll try to do good with it. (laughs) Okay, enough uncomfortable sales attempts. I am so bad at selling things. (laughs) Let's talk about something that is more comfortable, like a book about death. (laughs) So really, this is more of a book that is about life, but the two do go hand in hand, and the main character of this book works as a death doula. So the book is called The Collected Regrets of Clover by Mickey Brammer, and I love that the main character is a death doula. This is actually something that I have considered pursuing a few times now. Um, I can definitely see it being part of my journey. It's not the right moment. But I'm just fascinated by it, and it seems like such a, a noble and important thing to provide people. So I could definitely see myself going down that path at some point. Anyway, our main character, Clover, is also a loner. She has no real mother figure, no friends, and a completely non-existent love life. Her whole existence is wrapped up in death. And most people do not feel comfortable discussing it and definitely don't understand how Clover can work with the dying. So Clover had been traveling the world. She was studying how different cultures uh, handle death and the different uh, rituals that surround it. But she had to return to New York City when her grandfather passed away. She grew up with him because her parents died when she was six, and he was all that she had. Now she lives in his apartment, and other than her occasional chats with her elderly neighbor, she doesn't really talk to anyone outside of work. She also keeps records of the last words of the dying, and she sorts them into three categories, with regrets being the most prevalent. (laughs) And this kind of makes her begin to question her own existence. 
as it would. (laughs) So soon after, she ends up meeting a new neighbor named Sylvie, and she quickly becomes a potential new friend. Clover also meets a somewhat insistent man named Sebastian, who is dealing with his grandmother's stage 4 cancer diagnosis, but also is kind of interested in dating Clover. It's a little muddled. (laughs) Clover starts out as a death doula for his grandmother, Claudia, and the two women bond instantly. Claudia reveals a lot of her regrets and also that she has a long-lost love during her chats with Clover. Clover happens to mention this romantic story to her new friend Sylvie, who takes it upon herself to Google and find Claudia's first love. He now lives in Maine. (laughs) So Clover decides to hunt down this man and try to relieve at least one of Claudia's regrets before she passes. In the process of trying to find this man, Clover finds something that she has been looking for her entire life, if she's brave enough to start living. (laughs) This, honestly, was exactly the type of book that I needed with how I've been feeling lately. I, like I said, am fascinated by death doulas, so I was already interested. And then Clover is such a sweet, kind, and sort of simple woman. Not, like, in a bad way or anything like that. Just unguided in a lot of significant ways. And honestly, I can kind of relate to that, too. This book did momentarily frustrate me because... It was like a little too magical, you know, but I really, really loved it. Books are portable magic. I can't remember who said that quote, but it is so true. And this was just such a sweet and wonderful book and such a breath of fresh air, you know, compared to my usual thrillers. (laughs) And this book made me sob. (laughs) And yes, I am an emotional person. And yes, lately I have been super emotional. (laughs) But it was also just such a beautiful message of life and love and taking chances. And I don't know, it just hit me really hard. And it made me cry a lot. (laughs) It is a truly beautiful book. And I highly recommend The Collected Regrets of Clover by Mika Brammer. It's fabulous. (laughs) Okay, so really briefly, I have a little cat thing to talk about. It's been a while since we were talking about the cats. It's not just a books podcast. (laughs) Anyway, have you seen on TikTok this big fluffy orange cat named Walter? I'm sure if you like anything with cats on TikTok, you've probably seen him. He's everywhere. Um, I love the posts of this. I think the name is like Walter and Gus or something like that, but... I think I've only ever seen pictures of Walter, so I'm not sure. But he is just adorable. The posts are really, really funny. And the best one by far is the one of Walter and his tie. He has a little red necktie, and he actually, like, strokes it with one of his paws while just staring, unblinking at the camera. Because that's kind of his thing. That's what all the videos are. (laughs) It's just this big, fluffy orange cat just staring without moving or blinking or anything for a very long time. (laughs) They're so cute and just so funny. So this week for the quote of the week, I have three quotes for you, and they all come from this week's book. Like I said, it was fantastic. So why don't we do some quotes? The first one is, who are we to tell anyone their pain isn't worthy? And I like that, and I think that applies to, well, everyone. The second one is, until we meet, I'll look at the moon because it's the one thing we both share. And finally, the last one is, and instead of constantly asking ourselves the question of why we're here, maybe we should be savoring a simpler truth. We are here. And that one is by far my favorite. Uh, I think that's a pretty good way to live life. (laughs) Now I'm going to take a quick break, and I will be right back with a new chapter of my weekly writing project. Be right back. Welcome back, book lovers. So I was listening to some older episodes of the podcast recently, and it was a trip. (laughs) I do have to say that I have improved quite a bit in three years, but overall I was still pretty happy with it, like it wasn't so cringeworthy and awful. 
um, which is a relief. I tend to create things and then let them go out into the world, and then my brain kind of convinces me that somehow it has morphed into this horrible thing. I don't know. Yay, my brain's fun. (laughs) Anyway, I also had some episodes where I had my kids on the podcast, and they sound so little, and now they're teenagers, and their voices have changed and gotten all deep, and they sound like adults, and it's really weird. (laughs) I love being a mom. Just watching them grow and change and go through all the stages of life is just, it's incredible. (laughs) It's so cool. Anyway, enjoy chapter 26 of my weekly writing project, Secret Keeper. Chapter 26. Morena sat motionless, sunk deep into a plush black velvet sofa. It held her too close and stuck to her skin. The room was too hot and sweat rolled down her temples. Before her, the fire was raging and roaring in the hearth. It slipped past the boundaries of the hearth and seemed to inch closer and closer to where Marina was sitting. Kevo hovered over her, wobbling back and forth behind the sofa, and occasionally dripping drool onto her shoulders. Even when the disgusting globs hit her, Marina did not move. She kept her rigid posture, and only her eyes moved as they followed Francie around. Her cousin had gone through something during her years of solitude. Morena feared this version of Francie the most. This one seemed unhinged and without care for anyone or anything. She exuded an intense manic energy, and it made Morena nervous, though her cousin had promised that she would be safe. Francie had been talking nonstop. At the moment, she was practicing what she called her routine and was cackling wildly at every attempt at a joke. Morena tried not to think. She had to keep her mind empty when her cousin was around. She knew that their powers had become sketchy and unreliable, but she couldn't risk Francie being able to see her thoughts. Francie paused, laughed, and gestured to Marina impatiently. She forced a smile that appeased her cousin. Francie continued to prattle on. Kevo grunted behind Marina, and she felt another disgusting drop land on her neck. It slid down her back, and she fought the urge to gag with revulsion. She had to keep still. Still was safe. The sudden rumbling of the door sliding open stopped Francie mid-joke. Her smile fell away, and a flash of rage lit her eyes. She hated being interrupted. She positioned herself in front of the door with her hands on her hips. Kevo lumbered over to hover just behind her shoulder, waiting for any possible command. Marina shifted in small, imperceptible movements, until she could see the open doorway in the space between Kevo's massive body and Francie's wide stance. Kevo's massive hulk wavered to the side, and Marina glimpsed two figures in the shadowy hallway. One stepped into the door and knelt before Francie. She presented her hand, and he kissed it. She caressed his handsome face, and then squeezed it tightly. He winced, but did not pull away. When she released him, he rose unsteadily and tossed his blonde mop of hair from his eyes. He looked around dazedly, but just for a moment, he made eye contact with Marina and for that one instance, he seemed clear and sharp-eyed. Francie didn't notice the change. She was motioning for the other figure to step forward. When she did, Marina gasped. She couldn't stop herself. Francie spun around and narrowed her eyes suspiciously at her cousin. She turned quickly back as the pale lavender creature that had haunted Marina's dreams for decades knelt before Francie and kissed her hand. Her face remained unsqueezed, and she motioned for Len to stand. Francie didn't speak, but she strode purposely from the room. The others followed quickly. Len would not look at Morena, but the handsome young man gave her a pointed look as he left. Kevo lumbered after them, and the door rumbled shut behind him. Morena was alone. She stood quickly, but sat again a moment later, when the fires blazed up and forced her back into her seat. Of course, Francie was prepared for everything. Morena settled back into her plush prison. Inactivity was as much a punishment as anything else. She wanted to move. Her wings itched to spread and soar. The room was oppressive, but it was more than that. She could feel the heaviness of the stone pressing in around her. She felt confined and cramped. She didn't dare to move. She was afraid she might set something in motion. Apparently, Francie shared that fear. 
Marina leaned her head back, letting it sink heavily into the plush pillows. The fabric molded itself around her and clung to her, snug and supportive. She sighed. It had been such a pleasure to not be allowed to think. To avoid reality. To ignore the future even as she hurtled toward it. She wasn't spending every moment planning and projecting and constantly worrying. Was it worth it? The fight. The struggle. Marina was tired. So deeply exhausted. Especially lately. But it began before then. When she first spotted the little girl in the woods. Maybe knowing she had someone to take her place had allowed her to finally age. It hit her all at once. The most rapid decline she'd experienced in her long, lonely life. Was it any worse to pass her days with her cousin? To listen to her rambling jokes and force a smile? It seemed so much easier of an existence. And Morena was not sure exactly what she was fighting for, or who she was fighting. Did she even have a side? The sofa emitted a pleasant heat, and it concentrated on her tense neck and shoulders. Morena sighed again, and she slipped a little deeper into the softness. She closed her eyes to savor the moment of bliss. It passed far too quickly. Morena was yanked from the warmth and comfort and tossed to the polished stone floor. A jolt of pain shot through her as her hip hit first, and then she saw a flash of light. Her eyes focused slowly on the scene before her. Maybe her mind just refused to accept what she was seeing. She had seen many strange things, but this was the oddest by far. Kevo the giant was fighting the sofa. He threw it to the floor and flung himself on top, sending his elbow smashing into one of the arms and crushing it out of shape. The velvet creature roared, if that's what she was truly hearing, and it ran away from Kevo. He laughed and smiled at Marina. His back was turned to the fallen furniture, and Marina had no time to speak as the sofa suddenly flew through the air, aimed directly at the back of Kevo's head. A flash of gold knocked into the sofa from the side, while another flash yanked Kevo away. Len made him sit down beside Morena. And then, with the briefest moment of eye contact, Len turned to help the handsome young man wrestle the sofa over to the hearth and into the fire. The flames leapt out to accept their gift, and the sofa made a horrid sound as it burned. The noise ached in the back of Morena's teeth, but there was no escaping it. They all stood with their hands over their ears and watched until it was nothing but coals and ash, and the sound finally faded away. The four of them stood staring at each other, their hands lowered slowly to their sides. Otherwise, no one moved. Everyone was waiting for someone to speak first. Um, thank you, Marina said hesitantly. Her eyes slid over Len's face and continued to the handsome young man. Finally, her gaze stopped at Kevo. Another like her, or close enough. He did not share her tainted blood, but he had been used up and left to flounder by the same horrible women. They bore the same curse, and now he bore yet another. For some reason, this angered her more than anything else. She laid a hand on his cheek. At first she couldn't reach, but he understood what she was trying to do, and lifted her easily, as if she was made of nothing but air. His skin glowed under her touch, and it soon spread. His body began to shrink and change. Soon he was once again the real Kevo, and he stood with his arm wrapped tightly around Morena's waist. He dropped his arm quickly and took a step back. Then he paused to admire his hands and arms, assuring himself that he was entirely back to normal. Thanks, Mar, he said. His face broke out into a wide grin, one she could not remember ever seeing before but she had never known Kevo very well. It made his worn face more handsome, and he still had a twinkle in his eyes, like there was still some mischief left in him yet, even after all this time. The young man in gold cleared his throat. I seem to be the only stranger to you, Miss Marina, he stammered a little as he spoke. I am Riff. He bowed low before her, and Marina could see he was trembling. She glanced at Len, but she was watching the young man and frowning. Riff, huh? Marina couldn't help her smile. The tall demigod seemed to shrink before her. He put up a front of strength, but he was soft underneath. Marina frowned too, wondering what his purpose was in what followed. I can't help what my parents named me, he said softly. 
Very true, Marina nodded empathetically. Nor anything else about them. No one should bear the burden of their parents' choices. Riff smiled at this, and Marina returned one of her own. Len grunted, and everyone turned toward her. Her face was flushed, and she held her body stiffly, her anger barely contained by her own arms wrapped tightly around her middle. Marina stepped back. She remembered Len's temper and had no interest in dealing with it again. Now that we're all besties, she said sarcastically, we need to move. I think we've wasted enough time. Her words dripped with venom, and Marina knew the last part was directed at her. She didn't need Len to look at her to know that. She wanted Len to look at her, to acknowledge her existence. Her pointed avoidance hurt almost as much as the last time they'd spoken. Len strode across the room. She was so small and looked gentle and timid, but she held immense power. When she walked, it came to life and could not be hidden. Small but mighty, Marina thought with a small smile. No one else saw. Len was opening a secret passage behind the hearth, whose fire was once again raging, trying to keep them back. Kevo was still staring at his hands, flexing his fingers over and over again, as if he couldn't believe they were real. Riff was watching the main doorway. Marina wondered what he thought he'd be able to do if Francie actually walked in. Out of everyone here, Riff would stand the least chance of surviving an encounter with her cousin. But Marina was not sure that she would do much better. Len shielded her face from the groping flames and slipped into the secret passage. Marina followed her, grabbing Kevo as she passed and pushing him through the doorway ahead of her. She heard him cry out, but there was no chance to react. His hand grabbed her ankle, and then she was falling, sliding down a steep, slippery slope of rough stone. It scraped her skin and pulled at her hair. She could see an opening, lit dimly against the dark tunnel and approaching at a rapid rate. She watched Kevo hit the opening just before she joined him. They seemed to hang for just a moment in the air before plummeting to the ground, which, luckily, wasn't entirely solid. It gave under their impact and cushioned their landing. It bounced them off their feet as it returned to its normal place. Riff came sliding gracefully from the tunnel, apparently slipping down the slope on his feet. He did a flip in the air and landed so lightly that the gelatinous ground barely moved. He and Len looked down at Kevo and Morena with matching wide stances with their hands on their hips. Only their expressions differed. While Riff smirked and his eyes danced, Len's expression was one of extreme distaste, as if she'd stepped in something disgusting. The room they were in glittered with emerald-like jewels and crystals. Even the soft, squishy floor was green and littered with tiny, shining stones. The light floating over Len's head was pale gold and made the room dance with reflected light. Morena was in awe of the beauty around her and barely noticed when Riff lifted her from the ground and placed her gently on her feet. He didn't immediately release her, and that drew her attention. He smiled and gave her waist a squeeze before stepping away and offering Kevo a hand. The weathered, muscular man swatted away the younger man's hand with an angry grunt. Marina frowned as she watched Kevo lumber to his feet. Riff met her eyes briefly, and his expression was troubled. Len sighed pointedly and threw her hands in frustration, and threw up her hands in frustration. She stormed away, and the light followed her. Riff hurried after her, trying to remain in the light, but Marina held back a moment and placed a hand on Kevo's arm. He hesitated and she leaned in close to whisper to him. Act natural, she said as softly as she could and still be heard. They have to believe we trust them. They exchanged a look of understanding. Kevo gave her a small, tired smile. She knew exactly how he felt. She linked her arm with his and leaned against him as they walked through the glittery darkness, following the dancing ball of golden light. And that is all for chapter 26. Thank you so much for listening, book lovers. Take care of yourselves. I hope you have a beautiful week. And until next time, keep reading. If Rep Media Production.